Friends, colleagues, good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the group of the European People's Party in the European Parliament to this event in which we want to talk about the role which European funds have for the development of member states. We have come as an EPP group to Croatia today because in recent years, Croatia has become a model for good governance at European level. I would like to thank personally Prime Minister Andrei Plenković, the colleagues from HDZ, European Commissioner Dubravka Suica from Croatia, the members of the European Parliament from HDZ who are all here with us, Karlo Ressler, Shuntzana Glavak, Jeliana Jovko, and Tomislav Sokol, for really putting Croatia at the heart of all decisions which are made at the European level. Croatia is today stronger, more influential, more trustworthy at European level because of the work done by Prime Minister, by Commissioner, by members of the European Parliament, and the fact that Croatia is today so credible and so trustworthy at the European level gives capacity to the Croatian government to obtain at European level things for the people of Croatia. For the last years, the European Union is making available more funds than ever to member states to develop countries, to overcome difficulties, to help people, to help enterprises, to help mayors, local, regional elected authorities to overcome difficulties, to modernize, and to make sure that for the future the economy is stronger and in a better position to face any adversity, any difficulty. Immediately after the start of COVID, the European Union made available the biggest package of economic support ever created, Next Generation EU, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, more than 700 billion euros for Europe as a whole, more than 5,000 billion euros in grants for Croatia, for the people of Croatia. We have come today here to Zagreb to talk about how um, this money is being spent, how it is being put at work for the benefit of the people. Transparency is also something very important for the EPP group, for HDZ, for Croatian government. We want to make sure that this money is being spent on priorities of the people, that people know where this money is being spent, and this is exactly why we are working together with mayors, with local and regional elected officials. Because you, the mayors, know best what are the priorities of the people in local communities, who was hit by the pandemic, who needs support to struggle with their energy bills. And this is why the voice of mayors need to be heard. The EPP is the party of mayors at European level. HDZ is the party of mayors, of regional leaders here in Croatia. And this is why we're doing this together with local regional elected leaders today. And I would particularly like to also welcome the colleagues who have come from the Committee of Regions from Brussels under the leadership of Olga Geblevich, the president of the EPP group in the Committee of Regions, and the marshal of the West Pomerania region in Poland. Um, so we are going to discuss today how we are making best use of this money because next generation EU is a unique instrument. It was created after a unique crisis. It happens once, so we have to make sure that we use it well and we develop the economy. As an EPP group, we have started this series of events, Road to Recovery. We were in Poland, we were in Portugal, we are now in Croatia, and I can say we clearly see the difference between Poland, which is a country where the government is at odds with the European Commission because of rule of law and money is not flowing. Portugal, where they have a plan, it's being implemented, but they lack vision. And Croatia, which is doing much better. We see a vision in the Croatian plan. We see a plan to modernize the country, to modernize education. We see reforms which will modernize education. It will give a higher chance for young people in Croatia to be well-educated, well-skilled, to find a job. It will be an important contribution to the demographic challenges which we were all facing in Central Eastern Europe. We see with the Croatian plan, a plan which will modernize hospitals, 
make sure that hospitals will be modern, will be enlarged, will be modernized. And we also see a vision to develop the economy, to invest in innovative companies, to make sure that the economy will be more digital, greener, cleaner, to make sure that buildings will be renovated in a way in which they will be more energy efficient and more solid in the face of eventual earthquakes. So we see a plan serving the people, br bringing the country forward. And this is the difference between a country well led by an EPP government, an EPP prime minister, and other countries that we were in. So today will be an occasion to discuss about how these amounts are already being absorbed and what the plan forward is. Up to now, I can say, and I will conclude with this, Croatia is amongst the EU member states which is performing best when it comes to the absorption of next generation EU. Croatia and only four other member states out of a total of 27 have received the pre-financing from the European Union, have received the first tranche. Prime Minister Plenković sent the payment request to the Commission. The Commission concluded that everything was fully respected first tranche was paid, and the second tranche as well. Only Croatia and four member states have received two tranches. Everyone else is lagging behind. So on this note, congratulations, Prime Minister. Congratulations, dear colleagues, because we know it was an effort made together by government, by members of parliament, by mayors, prefects, and representatives of the regions. We are discussing about this today. We're happy to be here. Once again, thank you very much uh, colleagues from HDZ, Prime Minister, Government for, for hosting us, and thank you to colleagues who came from Brussels, from other member states, Jan Olbicht, Vice President of the, um, of the group from Poland, Olga Gablewicz, to show the trust and the support in our Croatian authorities. On this note, I thank you all. I wish us good discussions, and I will now give the floor for three interventions to Jeliko Turk, the Chairman of the Association of Cities, Carlo Gessler, uh, our colleague from the European Parliament, and Dubravka Šuica, the distinguished European Commissioner from Croatia. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Let's have good discussions, and let's show the people what we did well so far and what we will do well for Croatia in the upcoming years. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to welcome to Zagreb. I will continue in Croatian, dear friends from the political group of European People's Party from uh, HDZ, welcome to Zagreb. It is my honor that I can, as the mayor of the city of Zaprešić and the chairman of the Association of Cities, which uh, has 127 members, to welcome you here. Uh, welcome to our Prime Minister, Mr. Plenković, Mrs. Shu, it's a Vice President of the European Commission. Among us, we also have the Vice Chairman of the EPP Group, Chairman of the Working Group for Budget and Structural Policies from our Committee of Regions that I belong to. And also, I would like to welcome all other mayors and heads of regional bodies who are present here today. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that we are among a very sensitive political uh, moment. So recovery and resilience is something that is quite important to all of us. It is clear that uh, consequences of the COVID crisis, but also new challenges in the world from Ukraine and unfortunately here in Croatia, uh, the consequences of the earthquakes that we experience all this uh, put new challenges in front of us. So I would like to say thank you uh, because I heard that Croatia is among the countries who have done a lot, made a lot of progress on all these issues. Mrs. Shuica often says, uh, talks about dialogue with citizens about our future and especially now that in front of us 
uh, we have measures that we need to implement related uh, to our cities and regions, but also to the rest of Europe. Is there any better com communication than the communication between regions, counties and cities if we say that one third of European public money is spent through a local self-government, if 56 of public investments is linked to uh, local self-government units, then these sentences are enough. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say thank you once again for coming here today in Zagreb. We are sorry that we don't uh, uh, we don't have all our colleagues here because of adverse weather conditions that prevented them from coming from Dalmatia to Zagreb. But I hope that this conference today will result in excellent results that we will be as citizens of this wonderful city we will be more than satisfied with and i hope that you will uh, take home only nice memories so once again good luck and i wish you a productive and good conference thank you dear Siegfried, dear Jan, dear president of the group of the European People's Party in the Committee of Region, poštovani predsjedniče vlade, dear prime minister, dear ministers, dear vice president of the commission, dear mayors, dear prefects of, from all areas of Croatia, dear members of parliament, members of the Croatian Audit Court, dear guests, dear friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today in Zagreb at this third conference organized by our political family on the recovery and resilience facility, the key element of modernization, strengthening of Croatia as well as all of Europe. In 2019, when our mandate started, when the institutional cycle of the EU started, it was impossible to foresee the health crisis, economic crisis caused by the pandemic, but also the intensity and the speed of technological, economic, climate, social changes in the entire Europe, which directly impact on all our societies. In the past several years, we were faced with unprecedented historical changes. First of all, the pandemic that revealed all our vulnerabilities. And then we also faced the brutal Russian aggression against Ukraine, which made Europe aware that taking the environment of peace as granted is not something that can be done as such anymore. Well, many external actors, unfortunately some domestic ones as well, forecasted the end of the European project and European Union. Quite the contrary happened. Despite all anti-European tones and all the ones who tried to gain a political profit in a cheap way and to bring into question the European Union, European policy in real time managed and has managed to fight against such sentiments. Despite the apocalyptic scenarios that were forecasted by the left and right wing populists, Europe has decided and Europe helps without calculations abundantly and invests in all parts of the European territory, but having in mind that development and especially at the time of crisis, is the only right response. The best example of this is probably this recovery and resilience facility as part of, an, of a broader record investment package. What does this mean for Croatia? When it comes to Croatia, this is a unique historical first cl class generational opportunity for strengthening modernization 
at all levels of governance and in all areas of life. With 5.5 billion euros of grants, and now with also very favorable loans that will enable financing of additional projects. Among the member states, Croatia is one of the pioneers by the level of the funds allocated also per capita, but also according to its GDP, but also in terms of implementation of the National Plan of Recovery and Resilience. For our political opponents, this is, they say this is some sort of automatism, but for the ones who have intellectual goodwill, understand that this has not happened on its own, and they are aware that everything is thanks to the government of Prime Minister Andrei Plenković. Nobody is more aware of the needs of local communities than mayors, prefects, and therefore they are our stakeholder, a key stakeholder of the government in the implementation of direct investments where they bring the major benefit for the entire society. Investment in science, education and innovation, infrastructure, entrepreneurs, green digital investments, change our economy, change our local communities and change them for the best. With record investments at our disposal and empowered by the entrance to Schengen area and Euro area, Croatia is becoming more and more stronger and more resilient. Dear friends, the idea of this policy is for it to be speedy in its delivery, but also in its effects to be long-standing and strategically thought out. Therefore, our strategic vision, our national plan of recovery and resilience is focused on the future, on strengthening Croatia and Europe in the face of all geopolitical turbulences, and now additionally through ePower EU in terms of strengthening energy independence. Let us think digital, let us think green, but we also have to have in mind demography, and we need to add value to the world uh, of 2030 and 2050 and not of 2020 or in the year 2000. With the successful implementation and use of funds that we have at our disposal, we are disarming all of those criticizing Europe, criticizing European administration by saying that it, it is hermeneutic, that it has no other purpose and that it only happens in some long Brussels hallways, or, or some people here say that Croatia loses more than it gains. And they're also comparing advantages and disadvantages and what we are investing in Europe. And they say that this is not clear. However, the benefits of this policy are not something abstract. Quite the contrary, they're specific, they're palpable, they're visible. And life in Croatia is, due to this, more secure and pleasant. The idea of today's conference is to discuss with you, with our prefects and mayors, together with colleagues from European level, to discuss of all the challenges and also to present everything that we managed to achieve so far. Therefore, I would like to thank you on my own behalf, especially the ones who are going to present all the successes from their local environments. Uh, as Siegfried already said, um, this is an excellent example, example of the implementation of a recovery facility and the colleague Sigrid Mureshan, who is the vice chair of the EPOP group, I would like to thank for this valuable initiative that 
will also take place in other parts of Europe. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your time. And I wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and dear Prime Minister, dear Jan, dear Siegfried, uh, dear Olgerd, dear representatives from the European Parliament, dear ministers, Mr. Piletic and Mr. Filipovic, dear prefects, dear mayors, Dear ladies and ge uh, gentlemen, uh, dear Minister Brnjats, it is my great pleasure to be a part of this conference today, organized by the European uh, People's Party, uh, to see how successful Croatia is in uh, realizing this uh, recovery and resilience facility. I was in Croatia when I had the opportunity to bring these two tranches that Siegfried mentioned, uh, 700 million euros each. I think this is a great success for Croatia, but European Commission, who decided uh, to make this move. As we know, recovery and resilience facility is a response to the pandemic that we experienced. We wanted to to strengthen uh, and make the EU and 27 member countries more resilient, at that moment we didn't know that we, we would also experience brutal aggression by Russia on the Ukraine. I would just like to say, uh, I will make a small digression. This is a total 67 billion euros that EU has invested in Ukraine for economic aid, for military aid, uh, which is 12 billion euros. So this is all done in parallel with this facility. As you can see, US invested over 15 50 billion euros, and we invested even more. And there are a lot of other data, but I will uh, finish my digression. My apologies to the Minister of Foreign Affairs for not greeting him at the beginning, and our Ivana from Luxembourg, uh, from uh, European uh, Audits Court. As you, as you know, uh, in regard to this facility, this facility has been a great success. Of course, this does not mean that we should not follow the rules regarding different mechanisms of the EU, but these were a bit more flexible uh, rules because uh, we wanted for the mayors, prefects and others to be able to use these funds uh, in the best possible manner. Uh, of course, uh, some procedures were slowed down by the public tenders, but still we managed to uh, do the work. For the first time in history, EU is in debt on financial market and capital market to ensure these funds before uh, st member states did that by themselves. But this, for the first time, was done by the European Union itself, as we've heard from Carlo before, we are in debt as a union for the first time in history. And this was the result of joint agreement from all the leaders in the EU. Through this facility, we cover two key areas, recovery as a direct response to the pandemic. And also, we want to prepare for future challenges, so we want to become more resilient. As we've heard, Croatia has been quite successful in using these funds compared to the size of our economy. Uh, Croatia is one of uh, member states that will receive uh, the majority of funds from this facility, and grants are 9% of our GDP. As we've heard from Siegfried, we are a third member state out of all 27 who has requested the second tranche from this facility. 
we fulfilled all the criteria and from since last year we received 2.2 billion euros which is more than 40 percent of the total 5.5 5, uh, billion which is meant for Croatia from this facility we have established a strong uh, structure we have uh, an audit and control system in place and this was all done before making the first payment request so we have different bodies for prevention of corruption fraud and so on it is also important to continue with implementing the projects this event today is uh, another contribution to these efforts. I am certain that our creation counties, cities, and local communities will continue being successful as they have been so far. And we, we focused on the territorial and local dimension. Considering I am the Vice President for European Commission for Democracy and De Demography, it is also important to mention the effects on uh, demography and aging population that we have here. But not only in Croatia, this phenomenon, uh, phenomenon is in, uh, present in all member states. So I'm happy that in our plan we have significant funds for encouraging positive demographic uh, trends. When we talk about transition, we have digital and green transitions. But third transition is demographic transition that maybe we are not aware of sufficiently, but we need to take, take it into account and we need to invest funds into it. Uh, results will not come overnight, but they will come. Of course, we also have reform of the educational system uh, uh, here in Croatia. We want to uh, build and reconstruct uh, kindergartens, elementary schools. Also, uh, if we are not active in other areas, uh, buildings will not be enough. Kindergartens will not be enough. When we talk about demography, we have a number of policies. We don't have one measure. We have several of them. They're all uh, common measures on a local, uh, state, and European levels. And we need to make effort. Otherwise, we will not succeed. We need to invest in infrastructure, as we know, for transportation, railroads, roads. We put aside 700 million euros. We want to increase competitiveness of Croatia. We also used funds, and we need to use them together with cohesion structural funds. We said that cohesion and structural funds uh, have a bit, uh, have some conditions and requirements that are a bit stricter, but we still need to fulfill them. But we, are, we need to use all these funds. We also need to use the possibility of so-called talent booster mechanism. We want to track talent. This is initiative of European Commission. And this initiative is focused on increasing competitiveness of regions which are faced with dual challenges. Uh, people leaving and uh, reducing the number of highly educated or high educated people. So we knew to, we need to use all the possibilities within this booster mechanism. Today we are also uh, remembering our success so far, but we need to continue our work to ensure our future, and if some new crisis appears, we need to be ready. We need to strengthen our society, our democracy, especially nowadays. As you know, European, uh, European Commission has uh, stated that uh, a new mechanisms for defending our democracy will be in place by May this year, because democracy is something that needs to be strengthened. We need to be ready against hybrid threats and other types of threats to defend our democracy. 
we are working on defending our democracy from within. We need to educate our young people in kindergartens, in schools, to know, for them to know what is fake news, what is hybrid threat. And so these are all long-term measures, and I hope we will be successful in those measures. And of course, we've seen from uh, Russian uh, aggression to Ukraine that we are not in business as usual situation anymore. So every European Commission is uh, making a lot of effort to fight against these uh, threats. We will soon be receiving the third tranche, and I hope we will continue being successful. Thank you. Colleagues, and now it is our privilege to welcome this morning with us the Prime Minister of Croatia, President of HTZ, Andrei Plenković. It is our privilege to welcome him this morning, and it is also a privilege for Croatia and for the people of Croatia to be led by Andrei Plenković these years. We are seeing that Europe makes important decisions these years, and we are all seeing how important it is that Croatia is being led in a credible and in a strong way at European level. Croatia is today a member of the Schengen area. Croatia is today a member of the Euro area. Croatia is part of all decisions which are being made at European level. The voice of Croatia is stronger and clearer than ever. Thanks to the efforts of all of you under the leadership of the Prime Minister, it's a privilege to have you with us today. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I welcome you all, dear Siegfried. Thank you for this introduction and for coming to you as the member of the presidency of the European People's Party and of the European Parliament, dear Jan Olbricht. I am happy to see you here as one of the most experienced members of Parliament that you are here with us today. And I would like to thank our Olbrit Gerdovic, President of European People's Party Club at the Committee of the Regions, who is also here so that he could, at this conference, with all the key stakeholders of HDZ and members of the government, I welcome them as well, Vice President of the European Commission Judge at the Court of Auditors, our four uh, MEP, MPs of the European Parliament, dear prefects and mayors, I'm happy to see you all here to discuss important instruments um, for the development of Croatia and for amendment of the financing instrument. This is seven-year multi-annual budgetary framework. I'm especially happy that today's conference can be used to remind ourselves and the Croatian government on the power and strength of the European People's Party and HDZ when we talk about Croatia, especially when it comes to local government units. The local elections, I want to remind our colleagues who might not be aware of this, with partners, won 75% of counties. We have 15 out of 20, which is the best result ever that we managed to achieve in the elections in 2020. HDZ has the trust of people in 45% of cities and 45% of municipalities. Of course, this is the seventh year of our second mandate in row, along with our political partners at the national level. These are representatives of liberal parties, pensioners and national minorities, we have a stable parliamentary majority that ensure the main, the, the main precondition for political stability. I keep repeating this in public so that the majority of actors in Croatia, especially our critics and from the part of the media public, could understand the distinction between political stability and stagnation because there's a huge difference. 
political stability that we have brings economic and social prosperity and development and stagnation would mean that we are lagging behind those who are more developed than us. And due to this key precondition, this is not the case, but we are experiencing um, development. And as Sigurd, Sigurd said, uh, Croatia is one of the countries that became member of the Schengen area, Eurozone, NATO, zone, NATO and so on. And I will keep repeating all this because this is something that needs to be repeated and people need to become aware of this regardless of everything that is being going on in the media. Of course, we are not among the 15 most developed countries because we would be, we would be among G20 if we were, but we are members of these other groups and now we are a part of the Schengen and Eurozone and we managed to become part of this group thanks to our planned strategies. Um, when we started thinking about introducing Euro 2017, thanks to our great efforts, thanks to action plan to meet all the criteria and entering the Eurozone at the moment of the major tectonic crisis happening in the world. This was a financial, economic, social crisis, and we managed to meet all these conditions when the creation credit rating, according to all three uh, agencies, was at a good position. So this is progress. This is not stagnation. So at the time of previous crisis, that is still ongoing, COVID-19 pandemic, we reminded ourselves how this uh, next generation instrument came to be. And I will continue to what Dubravka said. Croatia uh, took presidency over EU in January 2020. For the first time in its history, commission started two months prior to this and pandemic hit. And this limited our activities at that time. We did uh, have some meetings in Croatia in early March, but after that we didn't have any physical meetings in person anymore and the economy is shut down, transport, education, our way of life changed. There was a decline in GDP in the majority of the EU member states and in Croatia this was minus 7.4% in 2020 according to statistical data. But at the time, together with the Commission and other stakeholders, we tried to um, tackle this huge issue this was an unprecedented um, issue because this was a COVID crisis. And so this huge issue and required a big solution. We know what COVID was. We know what the consequences were. And the solution is why we are here today. This is next generation EU instrument. The first such effort of uh, finding funds, allocation of these funds, grants, very favorable loans in the way to enable all member states to recover as soon as possible from the crisis that happened at the time. Of course, this happened completely independently of our wishes and efforts. This was an external factor. Um, before that, uh, under our governance from 16 to 19, uh, Croatia was in microeconomic imbalances, uh, we had budgetary deficits, uh, we were two levels below the credit rating that we have now, but we initiated responsible governance of public finance, we reduced public debt, and we found ourselves in a situation where our economic health and social situation was very fit and that's how that was our state of affairs when COVID hit. So resilience and strength of Croatia in its economic recovery is very important. So we had minus 7.4% in 2020 and in 2021 we had we experienced a growth of 13.4%. 
this has proved the strength and resilience of Croatian economy, Croatian workers, Croatian entrepreneurs. But we combined the measures of Croatian interventionism that were unprecedented. They were targeted and they enabled Croatia not to completely fall apart, but to maintain social cohesion. There were no huge layoff waves. Uh, the companies did not go bankrupt. Croatian families were not, their existence was not jeopardized. And we invested a lot of effort from the government for all this to happen. We enabled 800,000 workers in private sector, private sector, I'm not talking about state administration. We enabled these people to receive their wages. 100,000 companies did not go bankrupt thanks to our efforts because there, we enabled tax reliefs, we enabled them loans, very favorable loans, without interest rates and so on. So this is all thanks to the government. I'm talking about COVID. And in line with this, along with our partners, remember there were elections in 2020. On the 10th July, uh, we became part of the banking union. We formed a new coalition around the 20th or 21st or 2nd July. And in parallel, EU Next Generation was developed, which brought to Croatia, as you could see, with around 15 billion euros of this new multi-annual financial framework. And this was not a regular allocation. We fought at several levels. We advocated cohesion, regional development, agriculture, more for investment. So there's no segment that was not in the government's focus where we wanted to invest as many funds as possible for the development. And in relation to per capita, only Greece received more funds than Croatia. Croatia in first phase received 6.3 billion grants, 3.6 billion of very favorable loans. The fact is that there was such a huge economic jump in 2021. And according to the last assessments of the European Commission, that we are going to have an economic growth of 6.3 percent. And this and that we will be among four member states with the highest economic um, growth. And I'm talking about the um, period of Russian aggression against Ukraine and all the crisis, energy, food crisis and all other pressures. So all this speaks in favor of Croatian development that even the regulation on EU next generation reduced part of funds for Croatia because they saw that Croatia is recovering very quickly. So from 6.3 to 5.5 billion, which is still a huge amount of money. So since autumn 2020, I have personally coordinated all ministerial meetings and we have been preparing the National Plan of Recovery and Resilience. We divided it into five pill pillars and one horizontal initiative. And we put this, we allocated uh, funds for environmental protection, for economy, for healthcare, for social welfare, for judiciary and governance, for energy efficiency, civil engineering, uh, recovery after uh, the earthquake. And all these areas are of key importance for Croatia. And they're all part of this financing through multi-annual financial framework. Not only we developed a plan, we presented and consulted on it with the European Commission, we received a positive note from the Commission, positive assessment. We hosted at the time the President of the European Commission. We signed an agreement with her. We created a framework that lives in parallel with this multi-annual financial framework with this seven-year budget and the programs that uh, is being implemented through partnership agreement uh, with the Commissioner Ferreira. And here, with the Minister, Ministry of Finances, we developed another framework where 
we very quickly meet the criteria that we defined in um, jointly, actually, with the European Commission. And one of these project and reforms, there also there's this principle: do not do significant harm. This is an important criteria in developing these projects. And we focused on two global topics: digitalization and green transition. They're here and then permeate all the projects that Croatia is implementing within the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience. And we showed additional quality that we didn't have before. Along with Italy and Spain, we are most efficient in meeting the criteria and in tenders, in launching tenders. We already received 2.2 billion euros out of this 5.5 billion, so 40%. We still continue to implement reforms. Usually in March or in April, we send our report to the Commission, they analyze it, and then in June they approve it, so every six months they allocate the funds. This means that we were very wise in planning the criteria and that we are meeting them, we are receiving funds, and tenders are launched and we are using these funds and the purpose of this next generation was to find a solution to the major problem in a quicker way than it was the case before therefore it seems to me that this experience of croatia as the youngest eu member the use of funds from the national plan for recovery and resilience and next generation eu is a new experience is an added value to our abilities at all levels I keep saying that um, we will be able to see the benefits of EU membership in 2030 after we go through these two financial perspectives, after we use next EU generation f instrument, then we can reflect on Croatia before 2013 and what happened after seven years, and then we will be able to see that Creation membership in the EU, this was not something that happened by chance. This happened thanks to the work and efforts of political parties. We have people who understand what the EU is, what the European project is. We have people who had to negotiate on this membership. We have people who had to advocate for this membership. We have to have in mind that these others must not forget that HDZ government concluded these agreements. HDZ signed the accession agreement. This must be remembered. Even the referendum uh, was implemented, the entire campaign, and it brought 66.33. I am talking about this due to political topic. This is the the issue of identification with European topics and strategic processes, the difference between HDZ and opponents, especially new opponents, the members created in the la past 10 years that did not exist before, the element of identification completely divides us into those who contributed to the strategic development of Croatia and the ones who did not contribute at all. In terms of work, they play no role. They did not participate in negotiations. They never did anything. They didn't even write a note to some other club or European institution. So when they go to European Parliament by mistake or accidentally, they do not represent anybody and they never vote for anything significant for Croatia or Europe. So you have opposition, SDP, eternal opposition, and things happen by default there. They wanted to see how to maybe in some shady ways make Croatia miss the Schengen opportunity. Is that the right? Is that you, the four of you need to talk about this. This is a very important detail. Therefore, this difference is huge. So HDZ as a pro-European party, a party of the right center, the most powerful party in the European Parliament, responsible for the future of Croatia, 
makes strategic steps forward. Nothing happened by chance. New workplaces, new jobs did not happen by chance. New companies did not develop by chance. And in 2020, unlike other EU countries, there were zero demonstrations in Croatia. Why? Because we regulated the energy market, oil derivatives. We reduced the rate of VAT. Despite all these negative external effects that made a life harder for our citizens, but the government stood by its citizens like no time before with unprecedented action. And therefore, we combined national policies, we used mechanisms at our disposal at the level of the EU, and we did our best to make this situation easier for our citizens. And the price of gas, thanks to the agreement in the political council and the ministers in charge of energy market, leads to a decrease of pricing gas. And this will lead to prices of gas being lower than they were supposed to be. And therefore, it is important that you, as members of the party, be aware of the unit that we are representing. Sometimes this is represented in a project of agglomeration or construction of kindergartens or construction of schools um, for one shift teaching or strengthening judiciary system or strengthening efficiency somewhere in economy, in transition of renewables and financing future hydrocarbon energy sources. This is all part of our party's policy. So after achieving these strategic goals, let us focus on reducing inequalities in Croatian society. This is a very important element. This is cohesion. This is the core of what we do. Of course, we don't think everyone can have the same, but we want everyone to have a good life in Croatia. Therefore, we want to reduce poverty in Croatia for 324,000 people in Croatia. Now, if um, Com Commissioner Schmidt will be here with us, if weather conditions allow this, and we can talk to him about this, what Croatia can do in terms of social policy. Document that Dubravka mentioned, talking about talent. This is actually a document that precisely defines issues at the level of the EU that we are also facing. There are two trends of migration from rural to urban areas, and then these people stay in the, their country, or from new EU members to older EU members due to unequal development and higher wages, where market economy has been is strong, uh, strong industry, where they can earn more. This is not something that our friends from Romania or Poland or from Bulgaria or Czech Republic or Slovakia, Hungary are unaware. They all experienced the same, the same process, but they accessed earlier and this process happened in their countries before than here. It's an identical process, but meeting the goals of national development strategy using EU, uh, using the mechanism of next generation EU, having more quality, capable people who can implement projects fully in a high quality way, in a legal way, in for the beneficiaries and to add value to development, then we as the totality of creation politics uh, with HDZ in power will achieve what parties are for. This is the improved quality of life of citizens and improved economy. And therefore, it is important to have such conferences and to discuss with our partners who are present here. And colleagues had a similar conference in Poland. So after a similar conference in Portugal, where also in opposition, we are now having this conference where EPP is in power, er, where we can present all the achievements uh, that we have managed to implement so far. Therefore, 
are representatives from local and regional levels. People from Dal Dalmatia could not be here with us today because of these weather conditions, uh, but they are very active in implementing our, all our policies. And I think with joint efforts and all of you at all at your levels are working in the same direction, I believe we will continue to achieve good results. The government will continue implementing measures even after the 1st of April, where this is needed, calibrated, as we did so far, timely, comprehensively, and within the program of measures that we have at our disposal at European level in line with the European acquis in order to maintain and develop social cohesion. It is extremely important. We have to maintain it at a time of crisis at all costs. There is no price that the state and the country is not ready to pay in order to maintain social cohesion. cohesion. Euro and Schengen will bring advancement and development, the creativity of creation entrepreneurs. These are great preconditions in terms of uh, continuous investment in infrastructure. This will all bring progress. This will bring progress in education. We can all be proud that after two mandates of our government, every child in primary school in Croatia has free books, free transport, and free meal. This trinity leads to better learning outcomes education outcomes in all areas that have been tested. This is also part of our policy. This is our legacy as well. And this is also not stagnation, but progress. But without political stability, this would not happen. Uh, it would be good for Siegfried to explain uh, later on uh, what, uh, what means when you don't have political stability in a country. So, some other countries did not manage to realize these goals of entering into the Eurozone, entering to Schengen. So it would be, wouldn't be a bad idea for you to hear from others. So everything that we did uh, was not by accident. It was by having a plan. So I would like to say thank you to our colleagues, especially to our colleagues from the European Parliament, who in cooperation with other colleagues came here today and uh, gave their time, precious time, to focus on this topic, uh, to hear and to talk about the absorption of the funds that we have available within the European multi-annual financial framework and from this facility to use this fund to make Croatia a more favorable place to live and to fulfill our goals. I think we can be satisfied that we have our priorities in line with all the components. And it's on the beneficiaries to use these funds in the best possible way. And in the next uh, couple of days, we will have a new tender regarding elementary schools, for example. So thank you once again and congratulations. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Croatia is today a model for the whole European Union for making sure that money from the people of Europe for the people of Croatia is well spent and it is, and it is arriving where it is needed. Thank you once again to you, to the ministers, to the government, to local regional authorities for making best use of this European opportunity. As the Prime Minister has said, in other countries, there are delays, there are postponements, there are risks for governments losing EU, fund, EU funds. This is not the case for Croatia. Here we can talk positively about what is achieved. Croatia is amongst the EU countries doing best when it comes to accessing money and putting it at work. Here we can talk about developing the Croatian economy and serving the people of Croatia together. And because we said uh, we're serving people of Croatia, local and regional authorities have an important role. And let me just introduce our next panel, which has the title, Involvement of Local Authorities in the Design and Implementation of the Recovery Plan, Lessons Learned. We will discuss with mayors, with local regional authorities, 
And this panel will be led and moderated by Jan Olbricht from Poland, Vice President of the EPP Group in the European Parliament and responsible for the seven-year multi-annual financial framework. Marko Marusic, the Prefect of the Bielowaj Bilogora County. Antonia Jožic, the Prefect of uh, Bojega Slavonia County. And Ivan Zagar from Slovenia, who is the Mayor of, of the Municipality of Slovenska Bistrica. They will also be joined by Ivana Maletic, who gained a lot of respect while she was in the European Parliament as our colleague working on budget, budgetary control, and she now serves in the European Court of Auditors to make sure that money is well spent. We give the floor to uh, Jan Olbrich to moderate this panel, and we thank the Prime Minister for joining us. We wish him Best of luck and success in managing all of the tasks that he has. So a two, three minutes break for the Prime Minister to depart, and then Jan Olbricht will start the first panel as discussed. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you.
<clears throat> okay, ladies and gentlemen, can we start the panel, please? Please take your seats. Okay. I'm not from Croatia. You are from the Slovenska, yes. Dobry den. We are not so successful. And how is it in Poland? We are even worse because we have no zero. We have also only no, we have also zero. No, but we didn't we didn't we didn't, we don't even have the green light to start. No? Yeah, because we, okay uh, because of judiciary. Yeah. Because sorry, of sorry. judiciary. Yeah, yeah, and because the government is fighting each other. Inside the government, they are fighting. Yeah. So you didn't resort to this? Uh, no. No, because we, uh, they are obliged to put the uh, judiciary reform, and the prime minister is one step forward, and the minister of justice is one step back. Yeah. Forward, back, forward, back. If they will go back, they will go back. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please take your seats. We start the first panel. And I will first the, uh, would like to ask to, to, to the stage and to the, to the panel, uh, uh, Madame Ivana Maletic, the member of European Court of Auditors, with whom I had a chance and honor to work in the parliament before. Ivana, you can take the second, okay? And, um, uh, and uh, pre Prefect of uh, Bielovar Bilogura County, Marco Marusic, please. The prefect of. Um, okay, please, you can. So, sorry. And the prefect of um, uh, Pożega, Slavonia County, Antoni Ayozic. Yes, welcome. And Mr. Ivan Zagar is already here, the mayor of the municipality of Slavenska, Bistrica, member of the EPP uh, Committee of Regions. And uh, this panel uh, uh, will be uh, 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 about the involvement of local authorities in the design implementation of recovery plan. This is a very tricky question, you know, because the, Ivana knows very well, sorry, can I say Ivana? I, Ivana knows very well that the whole construction of the RRF is completely different than the cohesion policy. So this is different, that's why in fact, the structure of RRF doesn't require the consultation with local government. This is the specificity of the RRF. So, in some of the member states, the local and regional governments are completely not involved at all in the RRF. In some of the member states, they are involved in the uh, consultation, but also in the uh, in, in implementation of the program. So what makes the, the difference? That's why we know very well that the success of RRF depends on the real involvement. If the local and regional government are not involved, this is the risk that at the end will not be a success. So the question for, for, for you <coughs> here during this, this debate is, what about the involvement of local and regi uh, regional authorities, I mean municipalities and counties, in Croatia, and how it's seen by someone from Croatia who is in the European institution in the Court of Auditors, so the highest control. I mean, Ivana is the one of the highest controller in the European uh, structures. So I think this is very interesting because we see the success uh, in Croatia, it's very clear. And the question is to what extent this success is based on local and regional authorities. 
it's very interesting for me um, uh, 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 because I, uh, I am this kind of politician. I used to be the mayor and president of the region, so I know how important it is that the local government is involved. So, first, let's start with a uh, uh, member of European Court of Auditors. Ivan, I will make the speech. And next, we will have the, uh, uh, the reactions, we can say, the comments from the local uh, um, uh, authorities from two member states, from Croatia and from Slovakia. So, sorry, so, so, ah, you see, the Slovenia. Yes, because this is this. Slovens, the Slovenska Bistrica, uh, member of European Court, uh, Committee of Regions, sorry. Someone from Poland should know, but anyway. Ivana, the story is yours. Thank you very much, Jan, and thank you for this excellent initiative, Road to Re Recovery, all over the Europe, uh, going with these uh, conferences. I think it's a pretty uh, big challenge for all of you who are organizing this, exactly because what you explained, we, we have such a huge differences among the member states. But now I will, of course, continue uh, in Croatian. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, dear representatives in the Croatian Parliament, uh, dear prefects, mayors, heads of local government, self-government units, all the stakeholders in the um, Recovery Resilience Plan, I will be talking about including all stakeholders, not only in the implementation process of this plan, but in the adoption process of this plan. I will give you some slides which will confirm what Jan mentioned in his introduction, introduction. how different understanding of member states in regards to this facility. It was introduced in a very sh within a very short period, and due to this, member states tried do what they could within that short period. Some of them managed to consult some of the stakeholders, some did not manage to do so. This is why we have such a diverse approach and overview uh, within the EU. This timeline that Carlo mentioned in his speech, just like Vice uh, uh, President uh, Mrs. Schuitza, you can see how member states had different dynamics uh, when they started using this, this mechanism. Some of them uh, have only uh, had their plans adopted. Some of them just uh, signed the agreement. Some of them just sent uh, payment requests for first tranche. And some of them are among the top five member states which have uh, sent a second or third payment requests. Croatia is uh, moving towards these third payment requests. Maybe we will even be better even than Spain, we, which has the biggest envelopes regarding the fulfillment of key milestones and goals from this facility. But I will be focusing more on the participation of local self-government and uh, regional self-government units in Croatia, but also in other member states. What the regulation of the, this facility requested is when you adopt, want to adopt a plan, you need to have public consultation and all uh, member states need, uh, needed to describe how they conducted this public consultation process and how they uh, how they take all stakeholders' opinions into uh, uh, for uh, discussion. We noticed in member states' plans that some of them had public consultations, but in the majority of cases, they simply do not have enough time to have public consultations. And they stated that they had maybe one or two conferences where they mostly presented what they wanted. And they did not really uh, spend a lot of time in figuring out what local self-government units really needed. Also, conclusions of the Committee of the Regions show this. We have the uh, president of the European People's Party in the Committee of the Regions. 
So we had a small survey performed to see what is the state of play on EU level regarding public consultation, uh, consultations and participation of local self-government units. Some of them had bigger participation, some of them had smaller participation, mostly it was in the hands of the central government. And in this survey, uh, we noticed this lack of time primarily, but in some time lack of, uh, lack of will of central government to include local self-government units. What, uh, due to this type of uh, plan, uh, adoption of plans, which is a big risk, is that in the implementation process we will not have enough interested parties when we uh, launch a uh, call for proposals because these calls for proposals will not be actually modified according to real needs from uh, the field. Uh, we can already see some member states. We have a call for proposal, then you have a lot of proposals. For example, kindergartens here in Croatia, we had, uh, we had local self-government units, we used all the funds immediately. But in some member states, we had a situation where we had called for proposals and then uh, tenders, but we did not have enough proposals or enough projects because uh, local civil government units were not prepared for this. And they did not define what exactly was the goal of such projects because local self government units were not actually contacted beforehand. Regarding this analysis of the Committee of the Regions, it is interesting that those who participated in the survey stated that the plan itself uh, actually did not address the challenges that local self-government units face. They see this plan more as something being on the central government level and less as something that uh, something that needs to be implemented on uh, local self-government unit level. What we see in our audits, uh, auditor's court, this is an issue. So there are big differences between member states. When we talk about Croatia, I only have some several slides uh, on this topic. We have several very important reforms and uh, investments planned without participation of counties, cities and uh, municipalities will not be successful. It is important that we have you in this, that you know what you need to do because we will not be able to implement this and goals will not be fulfilled unless during this implementation of this recovery resilience plans, unless we have continuous consultations and that you participate and you show how, how this will be helpful for you. For example, one of the reforms is functional merge of different cities and municipalities how and when, which, count, which municipality or city will participate in this. And we will see how much this, was, this goal was communicated beforehand. Or, for example, other, uh, other projects or reforms regarding agricultural land. So without your participation, your knowledge on what we can expect, we will not be successful. So if we don't plan beforehand, for example, in this initiative, reparceling of agricultural land, we will not be successful. I think this, uh, for example, next investment regarding uh, waste uh, water and land consolidation, we will be successful. Also, uh, projects regarding schools, what the Prime Minister mentioned, this is, uh, these are all projects which will be on the level of local government cell units and without you we will not be able to implement it. And what we can see as lessons learned 
we as a court when we when we perform our audits in member states on uh, the central government uh, level, but also on the level of regional and local self-government units, we see as an issue a lack of flexibility. You have strict deadlines, which are more related to public tenders when we will sign an agreement and when something will be uh, delivered. But we know that market conditions have changed. We have issues with supply chains. And this all affects the deadlines which were agreed back in 2020. So this is important to take into account. This shows that some new instruments that would that would follow the similar path as this facility they need to be significantly changed and they need to be more flexible when talking about the implementation part and also rega in regards to the results which need to be achieved in this facility we have more implementation and inputs than results and goals and this is something that needs to be changed in any new uh, instruments that will follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now we will go to the panel. And uh, when you see, uh, we have just heard that the situation in different member states is different. And there are different approaches. I mean, lack of time or lack of political will, I mean, both of them. Uh, for example, we asked the uh, European Commission in one, one day, is the uh, consultation with local governments obligatory or not? And the answer of the Commission was no, it's not obligatory. It can be done if the government wants to do it, but it's not obligatory. So it, of course, makes the uh, clear reaction from the Committee of Regions. Uh, Okay, so now look at the practice. This is the, uh, the, the legal base, this is the political approach, and now the practice. In Croatia, you, have a, you are facing different challenges. I mean, like all of us in Europe, the question of COVID, the consequence of the uh, crisis concerning the war, but plus the earthquake, so the, uh, with all the consequences. So and th th at that time, there is the possibility t with the new plan which is coming. I, I just read that the, in Croatia, in your plan, you have 74 reforms. 74 reforms. So it means it's a lot. Many of them, what, uh, 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 what the, Madame Maletic said, is, was, the, uh, of course, impossible to implement without local. But it's 74 reforms in a very short time. You have uh, more than 240 milestones and targets. So it's really a lot. Okay, so what, ab what about the practical uh, implementation? How it really works in practice? Uh, first, I have the question to, um, to Mr. Marko Marusic, the prefect of Belovar uh, Bilogora. Sorry if I don't pronounce it very well, but the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. It is my truly, it is truly my pleasure to be here with you today, and I can share my experiences regarding our uh, Bielovar Bilogora County. As previous speaker speakers said, this we live in a 21st century, and it has brought about many challenges and many crises, and they are global and unprecedented. So. Croatia as well was not immune to all this. These huge changes are so big, so major that they impact the life of every day, every person and everyday life of every person. And of course, along with our government, local government units also play major role in dealing with all this because we are the first ones in the field and people we are responsible for expect solutions from us. We, as a county, have been facing uh, bad um, traffic connections 
and these impacts are economic power and strength. And the past few years, we have implemented um, certain things. We made some steps forward thanks to the understanding of our government. And now we have to finish uh, 12 kilometers of um, high speed road uh, that would connect our county with Zagreb or Croatia's capital and with the rest of Croatia. And this way, after we manage to make this connection, we as a county will become more competitive when it comes to economy and we will attract many investors. And this will surely result in um, increased quality of life of our citizens. My county um, relies on agriculture. This is one of the main economic um, areas and this is a key generator of, generator of rural development we have land we have natural resources we have a very good land and we all the preconditions are met for future investment in ecologic production because we saw during covid-19 pandemic how self-sufficiency in food production is important and places being more independent manage to achieve better results during this pandemic. So our, we have fiscal capacities to initiate um, speedy development. Therefore, this National Plan of Recovery and Resilience provides opportunities and possibilities through specific project, projects, of course, in collaboration with our cities and municipalities to raise the quality of life and improve the quality of life of our citizens and the inhabitants of our county. And I think this is something we should all strive for. We are not immune to young people leaving our county. So this National Plan of Recovery and Resilience that also aims to prevent or mitigate the consequences of crisis also provides an opportunity for us, our municipalities and cities to become stronger in order to face future crises in a better way. And I'm sure we will face certain crises in future as well. So I would like to thank everybody. And I'm sure that we as a local community through projects will be able to improve the quality of life of our inhabitants. Your, your last sentence was the important. The question is, what is it all about? I mean, the RRF, the RRF, the plan is the, in fact, at the end is to uh, 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 to uh, reduce the consequence of different crises, but at the same time is to change the quality of life. So I think this is is not always the same, but I think that reducing it means to to uh, fulfill the loopholes, but to make the quality of life is to make the progress. So there are they are different things. So that's why I think the RRF is is very important. That's why this is the response for the crisis. But in fact, this is in fact recovery and resilience is like not to repair but to reconstruct, reconstruct. So my question is to uh, to Madame uh, uh, Prefect, how is it the, in Croatian? Is Župan, Župan, but the feminine for the Župan? Županica, okay. Hello. Uh, so the Županica uh, uh, of the uh, of uh, uh, Pozega from uh, Slo Slavonia County, uh, Antonija Ozic, yes, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my honor to participate in this panel today. As you said it yourself, the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience is not only a plan for advancement, but also a plan that should make us stronger in, at times of crisis. An important sentence was uttered here by Madame Maletic. This is the way 
of how this national plan for recovery and resilience was developed. And today I realized that not all governments in the EU do the same as our government did. Planning and programming of the national plan for recovery and resilience did not happen in the same way in all member states, which surprised me because I think, and we in Croatia do it in such a way, and from the top government level to the lowest government level, we need to collaborate and we need to be transparent and communicate. And this is what we do in Croatia. While developing this National Plan for Recovery and Resilience, we also listen to the voices of citizens and local and government units. So all these important segments that make up the Croatian economy, Croatian society and Croatian politics in general. This is actually the way that Croatian, uh, Croatian Democratic Union operates. The, this contains all the important elements for recovery and for the development of the Republic of Croatia. When talking about recovery in this crisis situation, this national plan for recovery and resilience allocates a lot of funds for uh, engineer uh, for civil engineering, uh, construction of buildings, schools, social institutions, hospitals, and so on. When talking about resilience, we can talk about resilience in production of food. So through this national plan, we foresaw the development of regional distribution centers for fruit and vegetables. Uh, we opened one of such centers in Osijek recently. And I strongly believe that my country will be the second county in Croatia that will sign grant agreement for the construction of this regional distribution center. And when talking about what we are looking for in the future, I here refer to projects focused on education in my county, Pozega Slavonia, through this uh, National Plan for Recovery and Resilience. Uh, the construction of 10 kindergartens was approved, and this will help families who need to find places for their children in kindergartens. And this will also strengthen the economic activity of our inhabitants. And also there is a huge reform focused on primary education and also a single shift work of schools. In secondary education, we increase. We will increase the number of students in gymnasium programs. Of course, there will be big investments in science, in high science in the Republic of Croatia. And through this National Plan for Recovery and Resilience, Minister Brnjac was um, here at this panel um, during the introduction. And funds are aimed for the development of public and tourism infrastructure healthcare tourism or health tourism, especially with focus on continental, continental tourism. We know that Croatia has uh, well-developed coastal tourism, but a huge potential when it comes to continental tourism. And a lot of funds from this national plan are aimed at development of continental tourism in Croatia. So this meets the challenges that we are facing and that we will face in the future, but also provides a clear direction of Croatia's development after using the funds from National Plan for um, uh, Recovery and Resilience. You said it yourself, there are 74 reference. It might sound ambitious, but I'm sure we'll manage to implement all this. Very good example how to not to have money in our, in our country, like with all that we are, we have zero. So it means that uh, because of the political fight in the government, the, all the money is blocked. So for the local and regional government is really a disaster. But I think my, my question to you is uh, only the, the grants is, doesn't require your money. It, it's just grants. How important it is for, for, for the counties the, uh, that uh, the money is without the own resources which should be given, which is normal for cohesion. Okay, but this is 100% for the grant. Yes, in majority of cases, these are 100% amounts of grants, except in cases when our project go beyond this maximum amount that can be allocated regarding the projects we implement. There's a situation with the construction of kindergartens where local government units will have to participate with national funds and with their local funds from their budgets when it comes to construction of kindergartens. 
these projects uh, regarding um, tourism infrastructure do have a certain limit up to which it, they can be funded up to 100%. Uh, but after that, after if you surpass that limit, then you have to provide your own funds. But we don't have to provide uh, our own funds for the implementation of these policies and projects. But if we need to provide our own funds, I'm sure that my colleagues and mayors and prefects will manage to provide these funds because these are extremely important projects for the development of Croatia. Okay, and now let's go to the... I mean, uh, as I, as once again, I would like to, to apologize for the mistake. But anyway, we have uh, Mr. Ivan Jagar, the mayor of the municipality of Slovenska Bistrica, who is coming from the community region. So please, the, uh, if you have the first reaction before Olga Gablevich is speaking, from the community region, but also from, from your, your situation, or comparing to, to Croatian situation. What, what is the situation in Slovenia? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for giving the floor. Uh, greetings from on behalf of Slovenia. I would just like to first congratulate Croatia uh, for its successful implementation of these funds. Unfortunately, in Slovenia, situation is not the same. Re regarding the implementation, we we are more or less at the beginning. I think we requested first tranche, but we have not received it, as far as I know. But I think that we finished these negotiations very quickly. I think in June or July, we We received an answer from the European level, but when when talking about these funds, I think that we we encounter the same issues, generally speaking. Uh, this is partially from my my position as a member of the Committee of the Regions, but also as a local representative in cohesion. We have this partnership relationship, but here we do not need to have it, at least on a formal level. But uh, if I look at the situation in Europe and in Slovenia, uh, we have a lot of challenges related to it. And I think these challenges are uh, related mostly with this partnership uh, aspect of this plan. I always say that these negotiations you have on the European level, then national level, then local level. And many times uh, we have issues on uh, local national uh, relations. Local level very often is not incorporated in the right manner. Formally speaking, you have these discussions, as you have. Uh, different member states had different conferences, but the, the real needs uh, on the local level that we have on the field, these real needs are the issue. Um, we need to introduce them in these uh, EU funds. When talking about Slovenia, I think very often this is not so. I think a, a major issue is that this, for example, when implementing new funds in the future through this implementation, I don't know how monitoring will, will uh, end. We have already prepared one report uh, in our Committee of the Regions, but you will find in this report the same issues that we had in the, uh, in regards to cohesion funds. So uh, you have centralization, you have issues of discussion with a local uh, level, and we must not forget uh, bureauc uh, bureaucracy. Every decade, uh, we we discuss the same issues, but we still don't have results. 
So maybe commission sh should take these local aspects into account and to find a way that local level has this direct contact, maybe even on the European level, so that you have a real partnership relationship regarding the implementation. In Slovenia, we are not so successful. We have some other local issues. We, we don't have counties like you here. But we have regions. But another issue, we had a change in, in government. We had elections. We don't have EPP uh, in power like in Croatia. And a third issue, on the local level, we have enough funds. I, I come from a bigger municipality in Slovenia, and we did not find any tender where we could get funds for us. And when I hear what you have here in Croatia, we don't have that in Slovenia. We focused more on gr uh, green transition, of course, social aspect, health aspect. And I think that uh, we should take into account other issues territorial uh, social cohesion, I think we forget in these funds. And then other issues arise from these central issues, like brain drain and so on. I don't know what we can do through monitoring to, to, to change some things. Thank you. Now we should have the uh, the debate, but, but we do have no time because we have the coffee break. So I will replace the uh, questions and answers with asking the question to Ivana uh, uh, about your comment to the free, uh, free speakers. Uh, I think it will be the best way, and next we will have the coffee break. Uh, so Ivana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. You showed what was what was said in the introduction there are different situations in different member states in slovenia you can't even recognize yourself in these priorities which were adopted on the central government level because needs of the local self government units were not taken into account uh, differences in Croatia. We uh, launch a call for proposals. We have a lot of interest and then we take into account local goals and needs from the local level. In Croatia, we had with ESIF funds in the beginning uh, for the 2014-2020 perspective. At the beginning, uh, it was clear that, for example, entrepreneurs were not consulted because we would launch a call for proposals, but we had no uh, interest because, uh, because they were not consulted. If it were based on consultations with the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, then they would be interested in those proposals. The same was with local self-government units. So member states, which uh, did not base this on partnership, we had and will have problems with the implementation, with targets uh, from this facility. All the commission says that they did not insist on partnership, like in cohesion policy, but in the regulation on this uh, facility, there was an article insisting on public consultations. They asked for all stakeholders to be consulted on a certain market, not only local and uh, regional uh, self-government units, but uh, NGOs, youth organizations, universities, uh, scientists, organization, associations of entrepreneurs. So it was important to consult everyone and to, to then try and modify this facility so that it responds to real needs. Some member states did so, some did not. Those uh, that did not do 
this, they created problems in the implementation phase, and they will be facing uh, issues in fulfilling their goals. And this is something that was important to avoid in the very beginning of the plan. The lesson is for everyone, for the Commission, that such large financing instruments uh, should not be adopted very quickly. It is better to invest the time at the beginning in quality preparation so that implementation will be simpler. Because if you speed up in the first beginning phase, then you will have issues later because situations are different in member states. I think the advantage of Croatia was that because we implemented, and this should be the same in cohesion member states, but we implemented all consultations and partnerships that we used in, in ESIF funds. This knowledge about local self-government units could be used when we adopted this recovery and resilience plan. And everything that we see as important and uh, required cannot be financed by, from, uh, co financed by cohesion envelope and is related to developing resilience because this fund must be focused on development projects, projects that will enable a larger, a larger and better resilience needs to be used. And this is how some member states, by using earlier consultations which were implemented in cohesion policy, they used this information to create better recovery and resilience plans. It is on us, on the auditors court to control this because we do not have the ideal blueprint that the commission says that it's for the future that this is the plan that we need to use in the future we see a lot of uh, gaps and disadvantages that we need to modify for the future with two comments one comment uh, to uh, Madame uh, Manetji just said, this is a lack of imagination in the Commission and in the Parliament because we put it into the text. We put it the consultation with local and regional NGOs, social partners, etc. But it was not obligatory. It was just suggestion to do it. So if, so if the government didn't do it, there are no consequences. We corrected it. Now the uh, um, Siegfried Muresan was the rapporteur for the Repower EU. Is the next, as you know, Repower EU would be added to RRF. In this case, we added the tax obligatory consultation with local government. Because now we know that if we don't write obligatory, it will not be obligatory. And the second remark, for you as mayors, Jupans, etc., and me as a former mayor and former president of region, Please, decentralization is not granted, is not granted. Decentralization depending on the situation in the, in the concrete member states. If you have the government who is open to decentralization, it's decentralized. If you have the government who is not very open to decentralization, there will be no consultation at all. So that's why I think that this is the very modest suggestion to the controller, to the Court of Auditors. Please look at the text. Because if the Commission doesn't put obligatory, the consequence of the action of the Commission in some of the member states can lead to centralization. I mean, the European Union policy can lead to centralization if we don't have the clear message. That's why you should observe very clearly how lucky you are in Croatia, that your government, which the tension between local and government is normal, it's always, it's always. But the, the, one of the governments is opening the decentralization and giving the floor for the local, the other governments, not. My government, not at all. So, so that's why, let, let's be very careful when we look at the, the, watch the hands of the governments, what they are doing, because as I said, decentralization is never granted forever. 
it can be higher or lower. It's changing. So I would like to, we can probably applaud the, uh, the, the panelists. <laughs> they are also at your disposal during the coffee break. Uh, uh, Ivana, thank you very much. Thank you, the panelists. I'm very grateful for the information. That for all of us, member of the parliament, it's important to know it. You know, we would like to have the arguments because we are preparing legislation. So we need the arguments from the field, from the practitioners. What we should do, we, we shouldn't do. Thank you once again and have a good time for coffee break. Well, thank you.
Dear colleagues, welcome back. Welcome back to the second part of our event. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce to all of you the uh, Minister of Finance of Croatia, Marko Primorac. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for joining us this morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the Minister because uh, the Croatian economy is doing well, but we need to make sure that it will continue to do well also in the future, and this is why I'm very happy that we have a chance to talk to the Minister about the role which EU funds play in the development of the Croatian economy, the role which EU funds play for investments, for modernizing the economy, for making sure that it becomes even stronger, that it stays competitive internationally, of course. Um, at the beginning of the year, we all saw that Croatia joined the euro area. It joined the euro area because it deserves and because it fulfills all the conditions. This is a clear sign that the Croatian economy is stable, it is doing well, but of course we need to make sure that as the budget was managed very well since 2016 here by Croatian authorities under the leadership of the Prime Minister, we need to make sure that public money is well spent, that the budget is well spent, that the economy gets even stronger and that it is reformed. So EU funds, reforms, managing people's uh, uh, finances, people's money with care. These are subjects that we're looking forward to hearing from the Minister of Finance uh, this morning. Minister, thank you very much for joining us on a busy day. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, dear ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to say thank you to the EPP group from the European Parliament and also to the European Committee of the Regions for this invitation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me to join you today at this event, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all. We live in really challenging times after the COVID crisis, issues that we have with the pandemic in Croatia and with the earthquake. Croatian economy, like other member states' uh, economies and also outside the EU, try to find a way how they could answer these challenges. Some economists managed to do so more successfully, some less successfully. It is my extreme pleasure to say that the Croatian economy, after this COVID year, where we had a significant economic downturn, like other economists, and economic slowdown, and of course, uh, harmful consequences to the state budget, Next year, we managed to achieve a 13% growth and we returned to the pre-pandemic year levels. Of course, the funds from the EU are funds which are available to us within the recovery resilience facility and thus it contributes to the resilience of the Croatian economy. In that context, I would like to emphasize that the topics like uh, using EU funds and especially the re recovery resilience mechanism are on the agenda of every EU government and also on the agenda of Croatian government. And this is quite important topic. So once again, thank you for inviting me. EU. Uh, next-gen EU instrument is the, respon uh, is the response from the EU without president, uh, which gives us optimism and an opportunity for our economy for the upcoming years. This is a large opportunity, but there will be a lot of work in the usage of these programs. And the most important part is the implementation part. And this is what we will be doing in the upcoming period. 
In our national recovery and resilience plan, the most important focus is on reforms. So to use funds, member states need to fulfill Indicators, indicators consist of reforms and investments in Croatia. Reforms are key, especially in the first years of implementation. And these reforms are focused on uh, raising the level of competitiveness and green and digital transformation. I can say that 40.3% of total funds planned for reforms and investments are the funds that support climate goals and 20.4% of the funds also support digital goals. In that sense, we expect strong effect of the measures that will be implemented in the energy and transport sector, in management of wastewaters, and also in reconstruction of buildings. Total 5.5 billion euros of grants that we have on our dispose, at our disposal within this facility is really an opportunity without precedent for our economy. So successful and timely implementation is one of the key priorities of our government. In that sense, this whole implementation process is being continuously and closely managed with strong political support of the government, we have several levels for our management structure and also for monitoring and implementation. This includes a management committee, which is chaired by, I, by, by our Prime Minister, Mr. Plenkovic. He is responsible for political management, but also for the monitoring of the entire process. Also, Ministry of Finance, and this is my honor, is in charge within the implementation of this project as the coordination body, which monitors the implementation, but also coordinates all the processes within the ministries and uh, between the ministries but also between the ministries and the office of the Prime Minister. So in practice, how does this look like? At least once a month, we have this coordination on the government level, and we have every day continuous support by the Ministry of Finance, provided to the beneficiaries and also support from the Prime Minister to all the bodies which are a part of this implementation, both on political and operational level. Close cooperation of Ministry of Finance with the Office of the Prime Minister has shown to be the most efficient way of achieving our strategic goals. And I'm glad to have here Mr. Savic, who is uh, who would with the team from the Ministry of Finance is continuous contact and we are monitoring all indicators and we try to resolve all difficult difficulties uh, that occur. It is my pleasure to highlight results that we have already achieved and they have been achieved due to good work and coordination and excellent cooperation between institutions. We have already received uh, some compliments from the Commission regarding this topic. So Croatia has been recognized as a good example. Also regarding payments from the Facility for Recovery and Resilience for reforms and investments defined by the National Recovery Resilience Plan, we have received over 2.5 billion euros. So we had that pre-financing period uh, we, we have received two tranches of 700 million euros each, and for uh, getting these funds, we needed to fulfill a number of indicators. For the first tranche, we needed to fulfill 34 indicators. For the second tranche, 25 indicators, and currently we are working on the third tranche of additional four, we need to fulfill additional 45 indicators. So this is over 40 percent of total amount of grants. So Croatia has already used uh, regarding the speed of usage. Croatia is third in the EU, which has submitted a second payment request. And we are among the most successful member states 
reg- uh, the importance of these payments is lies in the fact that these are the highest amounts ever paid to the Croatian state budget through these funds. By fulfilling 45 indicators, Croatia will be able to use another tranche in the amount of 700 million euros. And in the first three years of usage of funds, Croatia will have received, by the end of 2023, over 53% of total amount of grants. What's important to emphasize is not the implementation. So it's not uh, the most important issue is not to use uh, to to get these funds. The most important thing is to implement and fulfill uh, reform goals and to realize investments. So our agenda for our plan includes a number of reforms in several sectors. I will only mention some for which I think they are the most important ones. First of all, educational reform. We also have infrastructural uh, modifications plan in regards to the labor market and their co- its coordination with uh, social service institutions, uh, improvement of the pension system and social welfare system. Uh, working on the issues of social exclusion, also reform of the judicial system, state administration system reform, especially in the area of wages in public administration, and also uh, mergers of some administration units, providing support in uh, corporate uh, governance in state-owned enterprises and also sale or activation of a part of the state portfolio. Also, energy efficiency reforms, renewable energy, and sustainable transport. These are just some of the topics that I feel are most important. Also, with 31st of January 2023, From the National Recovery Resilience Plans, we have published 205 tenders calls for proposals in worth uh, 2.5 million euros. So this will be in total 5.3 billion euros worth of the total amount of grants and calls of proposals and tenders. So you can see this is all in support of uh, performing reforms and investments. And this will help to develop Croatian, uh, Croatia's economy, especially in times of inflationary pressures and other challenges. Also, during 2023, within the uh, Repower EU and Recovery Resilience Plan focused on energy challenges that the whole of EU is facing. We will use the opportunity to finance additional investments in Croatia's energy infrastructure. This will allow us to have continuous energy supply and to diversify uh, supply chains. I'm talking about the uh, LNG uh, terminal capacity growth. We will also invest in sustainable energy sources in transport. And also, regarding the regulation on recovery and resilience amendments, Croatia will have an additional 270 million euros uh, at its disposal and also 3.6 billion euros of loans that we have not used so far and we will be using them with this goal in mind. Successful implementation of this plan and also the entry of Croatia into the Eurozone uh, have helped to strengthen international position of Croatia and um, on international level and also in international uh, financial markets. We have seen how reputation and credit rating of Croatia has grown. 
so currently Croatia is at its highest historical credit rating level right now. We will do everything we can to to fulfill these goals and to uh, achieve success in implementing reforms and investments to use funds available to us, but also to take care to build an economy which will provide additional resilience and protection to Croatian citizens, to our economy, to our uh, enterprises, and to have a better life. Thank you very much. I will use this opportunity to uh, to to say uh, that I have to leave because we have meetings at the PM's office all day, so I will not be able to be present at the second panel discussion. But I wish you success and pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much. Thank you for um, detailing uh, and presenting the impact which uh, the recovery funds have on the Croatian budget, on the economy, and also what was already achieved so far. As we said, Croatia is the EU member state that has received already 40% of the national recovery and resilience funds that it is entitled to, 2.2 billion out of 5.5 billion. Croatia, only together with four other member states of the Union, has already received from the European Commission the prefinancing, a first disbursement, and a second disbursement. So the plan is on track. We feel the money is being absorbed fast, but we also feel it is being spent, uh, spent well. And this will also be the topic of our second panel, because in the first panel we discussed about how we make sure that we absorb money based on the priorities of local communities, um, how we involve mayors, and in the second panel we will be discussing uh, the following. The title of the panel is Enhancing Synergies Between the Recovery Funds and the Traditional EU Funds, Key to a Speedy Recovery and Resilience, because we want to make sure that recovery funds are being used in synergy with EU funds. We want to make sure that they finance projects which otherwise cannot receive funding from other sources, and we want to make sure that recovery funds are being used in a way in which they would trigger additional investments. They support entrepreneurs, they support innovative entrepreneurs which create jobs and which create then additional investments. To discuss all of these, I will invite now uh, the second panel on stage. It will be uh, moderated by Olga Geblevich, who is our friend from the Committee of the Regions. He's the president of the EPP group in the Committee of the Regions, and of course, the uh, president of the West Pomerania region in Poland. We have Maria Kuszmisz, the mayor of Nowska. We have Tomis, uh, we have, please join, join us, colleagues, so Olga, uh, Maria, we have of course Tomislav Sokol, our colleague from the European Parliament who is very active in the Regional Development uh, uh, Committee, and we have uh, Marko Pavic, the Chair of the Committee on Regional Development and European Funds in the Croatian Parliament. I will leave you now with, uh, with uh, Olga, who will uh, introduce and moderate the uh, second panel, and of course he will also give the floor to Zvonimir Savic, the Special Advisor of the Prime Minister, uh, the Mr. Recovery Plan here in Croatia. On this note, I wish you all a good debate. And once again, uh, Marco Minister, thank you very much for taking time from your busy day to day to be with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Siegfried. Uh, and dear friends, uh, uh, firstly, I would like to share my uh, personal ref reflection. I'm very happy and very proud that I can be here today with you in, in Zagreb. Uh, and it reminds me uh, some memories from 2010 when I became a uh, marshal of my West Pomeranian region, very beautiful, one of the biggest in terms of area, something like 45% of Croatia, two million of inhabitants. And then I became a president of uh, Polish Region Association. And uh, in those time we decided to establish close link and very fruitful cooperation with our Croatian friends from, uh, from Association of Croatian Županja. 
Unfortunately, right now we have some kind of break in our uh, bilateral cooperation because of this COVID, of course. Uh, but I remember exactly what, uh, the first topic we discussed in, in those time. And of course, uh, the first topic was our Polish assistance. In to, it was in 2011, for example, uh, in, uh, in providing a knowledge uh, and good practices to, uh, to the process of implementation of EU funds, because it was just uh, before your accession to the European, uh, to the European Union. Uh, we uh, share our knowledge. I even sent my uh, people from my office to, to Croatian regions to, to share the knowledge. And right now, we are in the moment when you are in the Eurozone, we are not. <laughs> you are uh, very advanced in uh, recovery and resilience, implementation of recovery and resilience fund. And as you, as you know, the Poland have, uh, have the money, all money blocked. Uh, so, uh, so what can I say? Uh, it is that I'm very proud of your successes, and I keep my fingers crossed uh, to follow this good way. I hope that we will catch up you in, in, the, in the near future after elections this year in Poland, because uh, it is our third meeting on the same topic. First, uh, as it was mentioned, was organized in Poland, and then we, uh, we noticed 0% of, uh, of, of mm, uh, the, the uh, implementation of recovery fund in Poland, so it was not a very uh, positive discussion, I would say. Then we had a discussion in Lisbon uh, when the, uh, we discussed that unfortunately, uh, because of this socialist government approach, uh, they cannot do, uh, they cannot implement recovery plan very, very efficiently. And right now we see the difference in, in, in Croatia, and I'm very happy uh, to, to be here and on, the, on behalf of the uh, EPP group in the Committee of Regions and uh, moderating this, uh, this uh, panel, and I hope that it will be very, very va valuable for all of us, uh, not only uh, among our Croatian friends, but uh, for all our EPP uh, members in the in the Committee of Regions. Uh, I see after this first panel that you follow them, our main idea that we as a EPP, responsible politicians, we are not spending European money, we are investing European money. And uh, how do you invest? It will be the topic of our uh, second panel. Before of that, uh, I would like to give a floor to our special uh, guest, Zvonimir Savic, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister uh, for Economic Issues. The floor is yours. Good afternoon and thank you for the invitation. I will speak in Croatian, but for our distinguished guests, I prepared the presentation in English to make it more clear. After these introductory speeches, you've noticed that the dynamic of implementation of NRP is uh, very satisfactory. So I will try to sum up everything from my position and from my role as the main coordinator of the drafting process and then monitoring and implementation as well of this NRRP. On behalf of the Prime Minister's Office, of course, in cooperation with the Ministry of Finance, because the Ministry of Finance is in charge of drafting and implementation of this National Plan for Recovery and Resilience. And as you have heard already, everything is implemented in coordination between the Prime Minister's Office and the Ministry of Finance, and this has proven to be a very good cooperation. I would like to sum up key information that you've heard already and have been repeated several times and 
um, Mr. Mureshan mentioned all this many times as well, and I'm happy to see that Europe is aware of everything that we are doing, but this is also poses an obligation to state administration bodies and regional level and the government to be better and more successful. The negotiations that the Prime Minister mentioned this morning in terms of amount that Croatia has at its disposal from the recovery and resilience facility and grants, along with Greece, we have the largest share of grants in relation to the size of our economy. Almost 10 percent is the value of these 5.5 billion euros of grants compared to our annual GDP, which, of course, obliges us to prepare reforms and investments that can absorb this. Of course, when you have a huge amount of money at your disposal, this means that uh, in some countries this may pose difficulties how to clearly define investments that contribute to our economic recovery, growth and development. So all the targets and goals that European Union has defined by creating this recovery and resilience facility. Due to this state of affairs and this huge amount of money, we decided to strategically define the document of National Recovery and Resilience Plan that on how to implement this 5.5 billion euros into our investment. So we decided to take the existing strategic documents, the program of the government of the Republic of Croatia, national reform program that already defines our needs for reforms in, aligned with the European Commission. We also took into account country specific recommendations. This is the document aligned with the European Commission. So these are specific recommendations that we have to have. Our national program of reforms that is adopted every year as the basis for the reforms that will be implemented. And we took into account two mechanisms uh, that we, these are the measures that we have to implement as a preparation for the Eurozone. And we took into account national development strategy as a document that has been communicated from the lowest level, our local government units, to the parliament, so it has been adopted by the parliament. So this is our development strategy up to 2030. So only those reforms and only those investments that can found, find a basis in these strategic documents are the ones funded from our national recovery and resilience plan. If a reform or investment is not rooted in one of these documents, it did not become part of this plan. So this was our strategic approach. We developed the plan from late 2020 to the first half 2021. So this recovery and resilience plans, please, I would not recommend reading it thoroughly because it has 1,266 pages. But if you are interested in a specific topic, you will definitely find it in there. Here on the right, you can see the components, as our prime minister mentioned this morning. So we have the area of economy, over 50% of grants out of this 5.5 billion is uh, for economy. This is for tourism, agriculture, financial instruments for SMEs and also large companies. One pass is for public administration, science and education, 15%. That's 1 billion euros for science and education. You heard this morning 200 million euros for kindergartens, 300 for primary schools, for construction, equipping, and so on. This is a huge investment cycle. I'm talking about investments. But of course, it also supports the reference in this area. 4% is the labor market, 5% is health, and a significant part of 12% is focused on building reconstruction and renovation. Unfortunately, this is related to earthquake. So this is how we divided these 5.5 million of grants into these components, these areas. However, to receive these funds and use them, we need to implement specific number of reforms in all of these areas. 
So we decided to be very ambitious there. You will see later on, I'm going to mention number of reforms in the labor market, health, uh, in energy sector, in water management, in transport. And I, by this, I mean adoption of new laws, new strategies, new regulations, new rule books. And some of them are more significant than the others, and they require quite an effort from the ministry and the government and also other stakeholders in the society because everyone is for these reforms until they are not. But we need to implement these reforms. They are part of the government's program. They are part of the national uh, plan of reforms. It is part of the recommendations of the European Commission. Either we are going to implement them and then get the funds or not, or we are going to give up on this. So uh, implementation is an imperative for us. We have developed these reforms in an ambitious way. And this slide is a print screen from the report of the European Court of Auditors that analyzed specific recovery and resilience plans from other member states uh, to see how ambitious they are and to what extent they include the obligatory reforms from country-specific recommendations written by the European Commission, labor market, health, science, education. If you look at this more closely, this green part that says substantially addressed, this means that one country has substantially addressed or defined and obliged to implement reforms in the areas proposed. Look at Croatia. In the recommendations for 2019, there were four major recommendations. We decided to implement reforms in all these four areas. Also, these recommendations of the European Commission in 2020 as well. So on the side of reforms, our recovery and resilience plan is very ambitious. People from Croatia know that some of the laws that we have been adopting there are strikes in front of the building of the government of the Republic of Croatia. There are demonstrations. So these are very sensitive matters. But several times today, we mentioned that um, we collaborate with the regions and we have public consultations for all these new laws. And at the local level, we talk about these laws and they are being voted on in the parliament. They're being read in the parliament and we are doing all this in order to contribute to recovery and resilience and benefit of all of us. Look at other countries. It doesn't matter, actually. The point of this slide is to show you the effort that we have invested and we never gave up on our reforms. Some states gave up on certain reforms and on their implementation. However, if you give up on some reform, then you're not able to receive all these funds. And we would have to give up on these 5.5 million of grants. So you saw our ambition. So Croatian Recovery and Resilience Plan has 372 indicators that must be met within a specific period of time and deadline. So 100, we have 145 milestones. These are reforms, laws, strategies, regulations, rule books, and so on. Something that is mostly concerned concerning state administration. You've heard something about this. And there are 227 targets. These are investments, individual investments. Something has to be done within certain period of time. We have to launch a tender. We have to equip something and so on. So we have to meet reforms in order to get the money for our investments. This is the time frame. Until middle of 2022, at that moment, we had to meet for 54 reforms. So these are laws, strategies, rule books, um, and so on in water management, transport, energy sector, education, whatever. 54 reforms. So we have met all, we fulfilled all of them. So 100%, 54 out of 54. Many of you will know that to achieve 100% of nothing is close to zero, but this instrument enabled this. These red columns, this is the number of reforms 
in a specific that need to be fulfilled in a specific period. So first one is 33. So 33 reference by the end of 2021, then 21 by mid 2022. We fulfilled 33 and 21 reform as well. For the second part of the 2022, this is the third column, and we are now finalizing this. We are now finalizing all the reforms that we obliged to implement. There were 32 reforms. We will finalize all of them. This means that we will achieve the level of 86 reforms out of 86 planned ones, so 100%. And after we achieve 86 reforms, that is over 60% of all reforms planned within the National Recovery and Resilience Plan in only one year. This doesn't exist anywhere else. So if one indicator is not met, if we do not fulfill one reform, then the Prime Minister's Office and Ministry of Finance will not request the payment for the following period, and then the investments will stop. So this means that this is in all of our best interest to implement these reforms, because there are no investments if we do not achieve these reforms. So we should all support each other in this task. Blue column tell us, tells us about the number of investments every six months. So when you put all these blue ones together, these are investments, and the red ones are reforms, and then they make up these 372 indicators. And we need to fulfill all this by the middle of 2026. These are preconditions to receive these funds. So you heard that we get these funds every six months. We got uh, pre-financing in September 2021. Then last year, first tranche and third column are the reforms and investments that we fulfilled in the first half of 2022. We met, we fulfilled everything and we received the payment of the second tranche. This is the second installment of 700 million. So when you put all these three columns together, you've, you've heard of this, this is 2.2 billion euros has already been paid out. So all these three individual payments are the highest ever individual payments in the past 10 years that Croatia has received from the European Union. So red columns are those that we need to fulfill in the time ahead. So the first one that you see on the side, this is our third tranche of a recovery and resilience plan. So we are, it is underway. After we finalize it, we will ask for an additional 700 million. That, that will be 2.9 billion euros. So over 50% of the recovery and resilience plan within a year and a half. So, and then you will see where is this allocated. So this is a quite good dynamic. So my Minister of Finance is not here anymore, but he is very satisfied with the payments. So I'm going to tell you where these payments are allocated. So the first column, 6.3 million euros, uh, we had this, this is, these are the grants that we had at our disposal in the beginning. And in the meantime, due to this calculation formula of these funds for recovery and resilience, this amount uh, was reduced to 5.5 because we grew very quickly, uh, we developed very quickly, but we started with 6.3 billion euros. So up to now, planned investments and finalized, so planned tenders and finalized one reach 2.9 billion euros. So until the 31st of January, if you put together all finalized uh, tenders and all calls and financial instruments and all of this, this comes up to half of this 6.3, only in a year or year and a half. And as the Minister of Finance mentioned, by the end of this year, we aim to have over 80% over of tenders. And even if 10% is not fulfilled, I think 70% is still quite a good achievement. So the government and the ministry and the representatives of uh, municipalities and cities are additionally motivated by this. And we all want to make use of this opportunity uh, up to 2026. I don't want to say that some of the member states are slower 
or weaker, but they simply give us an additional motivation to keep up with our current speed. Uh, when you hear about Croatia, they say we are, we are last in this or that, but this has changed. Look at this slide. You can see vertical, vertical columns are member states and horizontal are phases in the preparation and implementation of the recovery resilience plan. First one is light blue. This is the information whether member state has delivered a recovery resilience plan to the commission. Croatia means that we were 16 in place who delivered this document. First was Portugal. Second line, whether this plan was endorsed by the Commission, dark blue. It was endorsed by, for everyone. Third, uh, whether some of the countries, member states were pre-financed. Fourth, light green, whether operational agreements were signed between member state and Commission. Yellow, whether member state has sent a payment request. You can send a request if you fulfill all the reforms and investments that were planned. Here already we have situation that some of the member states did not send payment request. Then you have first payment disbursed, so it was disbursed. We received it. We received first 700 million euros. Then second payment request. So if we fulfill all the reforms and investments, you can send a second request. Then you can see which member states sent second payment request. Currently, we have seven member states. We were third in line among the states which sent this second payment request. And we already received in December last year, we received a second payment disbursement. Portugal, a uh, couple of days ago, uh, received a second payment. So we have five countries which received second installment. Three country, uh, two countries already sent a third payment request, and we will be the third. So Croatia is third according to the dynamic of uh, dynamic of usage of these funds. So this is a message to regional and local self-government units that we need to keep up with this dynamic. You know, we were third in, in uh, world football championship uh, before, but now we need to show, but uh, through synergy, communication between ministries and local level, we can have a dynamic that is satisfying for all of us. So uh, Croatia and Greece, have the highest amount that they were allocated according to the size of their economies. You have to keep in mind, if you take a look at the slide of the cohesion policy, Croatia has the highest level of amounts according or uh, in comparison with the size uh, of its uh, economy. Deloitte uh, provided a comparative analysis a couple of months ago regarding the usage of recovery resilience uh, funds. If you take a look of the countries which have the highest percentage of uh, drawdowns of funds, you have top countries with the highest uh, top countries with the highest receipt of funds. Croatia is third. If you see how much grants we received until now, so we are uh, in the top three countries. And then you have top countries with highest mean relative speed of receipt of funds. Again, we are in the top three. So let us keep up with this result. Let us maintain this result. Let us use these funds because we have a lot of tenders. We have a lot of needs that we need to fulfill. And the assessment is that by the end of the implementation of this plan, uh, our GDP uh, could experience a 4% growth. So you can see how much this plan contributes to our credit rating and perception that our administration has the capacity to organize, implement these plans. 
Although we are the youngest member state in the EU, our credit rating, you can see Fitch, Moody's and S&P, you can see it on the, on, the, on the right side. Of course, nobody wants to be at the bottom on this credit rating scale. In 2016, we were on speculative grade ratings, BBB. Now, look at us. According to latest data or reports from these agencies, we almost reached the A level. And when you read why is this so for the last couple of months, uh, besides entering the Eurozone, agencies have been monitoring the implementation of EU funds and usage of these funds within the Recovery and Resilience Program. So you can see a significant, um, significant improvement on Croatia. We had a lot of activities in the front loading uh, part. So we, we are currently working on receiving the payment uh, in the form of the third tranche. And what's most important, we have strong political support for, in, for implementing this recovery and resilience plan. Because without that, we, we would not be able to fulfill and imp implement these reforms. So since uh, 2022, according to all three agencies, you can see the, the level of our credit rating. Currently, we have the highest credit, ra uh, credit rating in Croatia's history. Croatia is the only country since the beginning of the Russian ag aggression to Ukraine that received... Uh, that received a better credit rating from all three agencies. And this is not by chance. And our goal is to maintain this dynamic, to continue with economic development and growth and recovery, and to maintain and keep our people here in our country. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Savage, for this very comprehensive, uh, comprehensive presentation and very informative. I'm really under, uh, really impressed how ambitious plan you have, but uh, on the other hand, how uh, professionally you can uh, you manage to implement it. So, uh, so it is really very impressive on this big picture and this big data. And right now, I would like to, during our, uh, during our panel, go down uh, and ask firstly uh, Madame Maria Kushmish, mayor of uh, Novska, how this, uh, this money actually uh, influate on the ordinary people on the ground. On, uh, uh, and I'm, I would like to ask you for sharing uh, with us your uh, your experiences about, uh, regarding to recovery resilience funds, but on the other hand, how this traditional European money managed to change your uh, your city? Because we have to, uh, we we would like to discuss how to uh, how to build some kind of synergy between uh, both uh, resources of funds. So, please, uh, Madame Kushmich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Hello to everyone. Novska is really a small town with 11,000 people. And in 2017, uh, until now, we have been working on uh, preparing and implementing projects, uh, mostly financed by EU funds. Until now, we have reali uh, realized or used uh, 40 million euros, which is a lot for such a small town, taking into account uh, of covering all areas for the smallest investments, for children, for young people. Uh, we provide support to entrepreneurs, craftsmen, agricultural workers, but we also take care of our uh, aging population. We have to be socially sensitive and take care of all of those who need our help. As the government is trying to listen uh, their counties, we need to listen to our citizens uh, and we need to focus our policies uh, 
and our further investments on them. What is significant through small projects, and especially Novska has a good example of cooperation with associations uh, for young people, European Social Fund. We have invested in public infrastructure. We have renovated and refurbished spaces. We have managed to 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 uh, re to once again uh, activate those spaces, so young people can use those spaces. They can be incubators for social events. We, all, we also worked on popularizing STEM area. And what is key, we focused our economy on some new industries. Novska, before everything, we have, uh, we have uh, wood as our main industry area. And since 2018 till now, with the help of EU funds, we have started uh, and we focused on new industries, specifically gaming industry. In 2018, we got funds for entrepreneurship incubator. And we wanted to know whether we should provide space for entrepreneurs from different economic areas or to focus on one. So we focused on gaming and new technologies. Since then, until now, this project is maybe the best example on how one, one project and EU funds can contribute to wider development so gradually we introduced free English language in kindergartens with the support of Ministry of Education. Uh, and we have a new, uh, a new educational uh, agenda in our high schools, a technician for developing games. We also have educations on, on the basis of which uh, people are gaining new competitiveness on the labor market. And also, we encourage them to start their own startups. We have 10 new crafts and companies focused especially and specifically on the gaming and industry. And this, the, the trend of uh, young people leaving Croatia, which has started, which started back, back in 2013, we reversed this trend because we had a lot of young people coming to Novska because of this gaming industry. And currently we are uh, slowly uh, losing available spaces for these new young people coming this is the result of investments from the EU. Again, another thing I have to highlight, since 2018, Novska, with the support of ministries and the government of the Republic of Croatia, but also from the county, Novska is a town in Sisak, Moslavina County, has the highest increase in the number of new crafts and startups. And what is... Uh, Key information is support, regional support from the government. We wouldn't have the results that we have. And you can see that in the statistical data, in the number of employed persons, a reduction of the number of unemployed persons and the amount of the town budget. Before we had 40 million kunas and today we had 90 million kuna of uh, the town budget. This, these are the benefits of EU funds and support from the government, Republic of Croatia. And without that, we wouldn't have these results. And what is still to come are opportunities for financing new projects. Novska has prepared in the amount of 100 million kuna uh, sorry, 100 million euros, the biggest part refers to the next step in the development of gaming industry. This is a gaming center that I think will contribute to new economic and social growth. That, 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 would, be, that would be short. If you need more information, very much maybe at this stage uh, as we are a little bit out of shadow but uh, thank you because uh, you 
prove that with uh, European money uh, and especially with recovery money uh, can not only uh, improve the, 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 the standard of our public service and, and, uh, and uh, quality of uh, life of our citizens, but uh, also uh, uh, help to, uh, to rebuild our uh, local economy. And it is quite interesting how you manage to rebuild it from this traditional, uh, the, 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 uh, based on wood, the, the, the industry to, to modern gaming. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, curious and maybe we'll, we will have an opportunity to discuss uh, how you are successful on that. And as, uh, as I understood, as 54% uh, of, uh, of money from your national uh, recovery program is uh, dedicated to the economy. I think that that uh, your company, company from your uh, startups and uh, company from your city can uh, can be can benefit from this money as well. So uh, so it is quite a good example of building sy synergy. Right now, I would like to uh, give a floor to Mr. Tomislav uh, Sokol, a member of European Parliament and member of Regi Committee. Uh, maybe to, to come back to this higher level, because uh, uh, I think that implementing this uh, uh, recovery and resilient fund it is our uh, common challenge. And if we fail, uh, f f we, we can't afford for a failure, but we know a lot of obstacles. So, uh, we are right now talking about the uh, about leaders, because Croatia is a leader in implementing, but, uh, but certainly you know that in different countries we have different challenges. What, uh, what do you think, uh, if we should change something, because there are a lot of uh, some kind of uh, the, the, the ask, for example, to prolong the term of, uh, of, of, of finalizing, completing all these investments, because for many, many countries 2026 is not available, I would, I would say. Uh, what are uh, discussions about uh, on that topic in the, in the European Parliament? And what uh, is discussion how to strengthen this synergy between traditional money and this uh, our, uh, RF money? Yes, thank you very much. I will speak Croatian because, because of the audience. Uh, no, def defini defini yes, definitely this is something new. It's a novelty. I first want to focus on differences between um, NRRP and traditional financing from cohesion policy. This is an entire new European budget and it's temporary. It's not as cohesion policy. It's one-off situation and we need to spend these funds in a specific context in which we found ourselves due to COVID crisis. And in that sense, its main objectives differ from cohesion policy. So when we talk about cohesion policy, we have convergence, focus is on less developed regions, where here we focus on national programs and we take into account general national perspective and the main goal is to encourage economic growth and development to recover from COVID. Of course, there are a lot of similarities and overlapping areas. If we look at the main objectives of NRRP and if we compare this with thematic objectives of cohesion policy, we can see that some things do overlap, especially digitalization and everything related to environmental protection, everything that is green. And here, And we need to um, have in mind these synergies and national plans of recovery and resilience have to explain the complementarity of their national plans with the existing uh, funding sources, which includes cohesion. So states should foresee this and align financing from NRRP with other financing sources such as cohesion. When talking about prolonging, uh, prolonging, it's difficult to talk about this in this phase because it's relatively early, but of course not all states are at the same level. And this is something that we will have to have in mind, but it should, we shouldn't start talking about some delays right now because then we would encourage them at the beginning to, to lag behind. We want to encourage them to meet the benchmarks and, and to be you know, very quick and efficient in, in all this. And another thing, um, so talking about delays and implementation of um, 
these national plans, uh, this is related to administrative capacities. Um, so I'm talking about synergies with cohesion. The focus of the commission and national administrations is has been from since 2020 until today was on re recovery and resilience plans. So we are already lagging behind with co cohesion. So conditionally speaking, it sh this should happen in parallel, but the focus was much more on recovery and resilience, and this goes first. But if we start to prolong this right at the beginning, then we will not be able to meet the goals with the cohesion fund. So we need to talk about how to strengthen capacities, administrative capacities at national levels in order to avoid problems in 2026, 2027 with the cohesion financing. And we in the parliament fought for two things, um, despite the original um, proposal from the commission. And it was especially important for Croatia and for less developed countries is to have uh, the maximum uh, co-financing rate of 85%. This multi-annual financial framework was to bring it back to 75% before the financial crisis. So that would mean that less developed um, local government units, municipalities and counties, this would pose an, a huge problem for them. So we would have to co-finance each project with 30% or more. And so the ones that need the funds the most would find themselves in the worst position. Therefore, we fought for this 85% of co-financing rate because we want to focus these funds where they're most needed. So this is what we did at the European level, and we discussed about this in the Parliament. And to conclude, I think that states um, we should provide help to the states, but we should also push them to work as much and as well as they can and not give them the possibility and talk about delays uh, right at the beginning, because this way we would enable them um, to lag behind in, in spending and allocating these uh, funds, because we could face issues with cohesion fund then. I have to fully agree that, uh, that at this stage it is uh, too early to discuss uh, about prolonging, uh, but, such a, uh, but such a ideas uh, w were uh, mentioned during our last meeting, so that's why uh, I was very curious about, about it, but I think that uh, in th at this stage it would be demotivating for, uh, for a lot of uh, our partners. Right now uh, I would like, uh, like to give the floor to Mr. Marco Pavic, who is a member of the uh, Croatian Parliament and Chair of Committee of, on the Regional Development and uh, European Funds. And, um, uh, and my question will be about, uh, about the implementation of the uh, recovery, uh, the National Recovery Program uh, in practice, because I can imagine, because as we, uh, as we mentioned, uh, it is not only uh, about spending money, not only about investing money, but it is ab all about reforms. Uh, as we were informed, you have very, very ambitious plan of reforms in absolutely all areas, 145 milestone, and uh, how your parliament support uh, these reforms, what your, uh, from your perspective is uh, the most challenging, and, uh, and uh, what you are expecting uh, in the end of the day, after finalizing and f successfully implement uh, uh, successful implementation of this uh, of this program, uh, what will be the, the 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 how Croatia will look like? Thank you for your question. I will also speak in Croatian. At uh, the beginning, I would just uh, like to set the stage um, on negotiations and uh, maybe um, add to what colleague Sokol mentioned regarding MP or recovery and resilience um, plan and multi-annual national framework. So when Croatia puts all the financing sourcing together up to 2030, we had 25 billion euros. Comparing this with the previous financial envelope up to 2020, we had 10.7 billion euros. 
So we have two and a half times more from various funds. Also, this is the power of EPP and HDZ. We have people who know how to negotiate, who are familiar with European policies. And what we negotiated about CPR regulation 2014, 2020, Croatia did not react. There's an item saying that the countries experiencing crisis in 2008 and access the EU before 2013 would receive 10% more to cohesion. Croatia did not ask for it. We could have had 10 billion more. Now we have negotiated 15 billion from standard and 10 billion from recovery and resilience and 1 billion from solidarity fund. When looking at total payments of membership of, to Brussels and the payments that we received, not contractual, but what's the real benefit for Croatia, we are 10.5 billion euros in plus, out of which 2.2 billion euros from the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. So NRRP in the payments from Brussels makes up to 20% of what came from Brussels. When talking about the absorption of these funds, they're well, this everything is well developed and I'm happy that our colleague Savic gave an overview of how we planned all this from the national development strategies. This is the project that I managed for a year, government's program, so all strategic documents. We created a matrix and we took into account time and what can be financed from which fund. Good example is a recovery uh, reconstruction after the earthquake. You knew, you know that there was a huge earthquake in Zagreb with damages of over 12 billion euros. 12% of this national recovery and resilience plans is used for the reconstruction after the earthquake. We receive funds to recover for after this earthquake in Zagreb and Banovina. And we managed to use Solidarity Fund for construction and reconstruction. And what is not paid from Solidarity Fund can be paid from the fund for recovery and resilience up to 2026. And then on top of that, we have standard funds up to 2030. The same principle was used for all the components in the system from education, where the envelope 2014-2020, we managed to con uh, have uh, many, many kindergartens in rural areas. Now we have 680 million euros. 10% education and what will not be used from constructed from standard funds. Then we have National Recovery and Resilience Plan and everything is uh, systemized very well. I will give another example for entrepreneurs. I think that is very important, providing support to entrepreneurs. For example, European Commission has asked to invest 300 million euros in re reducing CO2 transmissions in transport with, with subsidies for electrical cars. We don't have any production of electrical cars besides Mr. Rimac, so we negotiated that we use 150 million euros for research and development and developing uh, autonomous taxi vehicles development, which will be done by Rimac, and 150 million will be provided through subsidies. A couple of measures was from the Ministry of Labor, but a part of the measures is for employment measures. If you're a new company or startup, you can get 20,000 20, euros from the Recovery Resilience Plan, and you can also get uh, vouchers for upskilling or reskilling and 50 million euros will be used for these vouchers and in the, in the end this this is a conference mostly for mayors and prefects there are no cities or counties which has not double tripled or quadrupled their 
uh, budgets by using EU funds. Mayor of Anovska maybe is modest, but the project that they developed with gaming industry, so small town on the margins uh, of, uh, it was on the margins, now is the gaming, cen uh, gaming center and they are managing that. That is a great success. Like, for example, we had a mayor uh, in Požega, Slavonia uh, County. We had uh, a new projects there. And this synergy, this synergy comes from the fact that the prime minister and all prefects have a uh, joint meeting every six months where they, they work on these projects. And to conclude uh, with a concrete answer, the role of the parliament in this process was uh, governed uh, by the need to have reforms for different packages. Mr. Morosan, we, we, we was present where we had a new package of uh, uh, EU uh, related laws. We had to change around 100 laws and bylaws to be able to enter the, the Eurozone. I was a minister for the labor sector before, and in my last years of my mandate, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of people who wanted to, to work in that area of amending laws, especially regarding social partnerships. Uh, Mrs. Maletic mentioned capacities. I'm glad that we have uh, a colleague from our central agency for implementing new programs, SAFU. This is consul uh, con consultation with stakeholders. So before the government presented the summary of their proposals, we had consultations with stakeholders to be able to uh, improve our plans additionally. We want to include stakeholders as much as possible, regardless of a short time period. And what we've heard now, what is key now for the implementation, and here I have to criticize European Commission regarding the, 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 the level of technical assistance from uh, other funds, we have the same people working on the National Recovery Resilience Plans and other funds. And that means that maybe in the future, when we have several financing lines, we will possibly not have enough of quality people who will be able to handle all of this. Uh, which are implementing right now uh, uh, recovery and the resilience funds that we don't have some kind of special support. On the other hand, it is 100% uh, per, uh, percent of finance, so, uh, so it is um, still very, very attractive and beneficial. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, maybe only three po points which really impressed me. Uh, the first really very, very professional uh, drafting and implementing uh, the, the, the uh, national recovery and uh, resilience program in Croatia. Really, congratulations on that. Second, we were talking about the synergy, and I think that we, uh, that you, in a very wise uh, way, built some kind of mechanism uh, building this synergy between traditional uh, European money and this uh, national uh, recovery uh, program. But I think that it is all because of uh, political sy synergy uh, between all levels under very strong leadership of Prime Minister Plenković uh, with uh, very uh, active and influential uh, European level Vice President Schuica and very active influential MEPs uh, who participated actively uh, today. Thank you very much. Uh, young, active and professional ministers and uh, members of parliament, former ministers as well. Uh, you know, I'm really impressed about the quality of your work. Uh, 15 out of, as, as Prime Minister mentioned, 15 out of uh, 20 Jupania 
uh, govern and 40 percent of cities governed by uh, HDZ and it is uh, the, the way how uh, how to reach the political uh, success and how to uh, reach success in implementing the cohesion political cohesion as well I just want to say one thing when we talk about results now we should mention the uh, legacy of the previous socialist governments which ruled from 2011-2015 when we were at the end of contracting traditional EU funds from cohesion policy. When we reached power in 2016, we only had 6% of contracted. And we were in the programming period 2014-2020. And one of the reasons why uh, why we, we we were late in using traditional funds because we were at the back, we were lagging behind. So for the first programming period, uh, compared to the second programming period, we started at the beginning, and you can see that we are among the leading ones in Europe. We were among the first who signed the partnership agreement for using cohesion fund uh, funds, and we are at the European top. When socialist government was ruling, we were at the back. So I just wanted to provide an additional perspective regarding the political party in power. Right, and it is uh, one more proof that uh, what I mentioned about the professional uh, and strong leadership of uh, HDZ in EPP. Thank you, thank you very much. end of our event. Uh, thank you all for joining. We are um, leaving Zagreb today as EPP group with the conviction that firstly uh, authorities here in Croatia are aware of the importance of this instrument. Both national level and local level we feel it's very well informed, it is committed and we also feel that the coordination and the um, political commitment to, uh, to it is, uh, is significant. Um, of course, that the upcoming years will not be easy because the recovery and resilience facility is an instrument with investments but also with reforms. As we discussed before, so far Croatia has managed to implement all of the reforms that it is required to implement. Croatia has reached all of the milestones and targets, but of course some difficult milestones and targets remain ahead. So it is very important that um, the authorities remain committed and also at legislative level, colleagues in parliament to implementing reforms so that Croatia can benefit also from the next disbursements without any, without any delays. It is also very important that the mayors remain alert, remain active, uh, um, come up with the projects fast because time pressure will increase. Everything has to be finalized by the end of 2026. This is the European legislation. That's when next generation EU ends. So time pressure will be big. This is why we will have to work together. We do everything that we can. We adopted legislation at European level fast. We are also ready to assist you, uh, but please, be there with projects and once you know a project uh, has received financing, uh, please be fast also with the implementation. Because at the end of 2026 everything has to be finalized and if any milestones and targets are not met then um, of course we risk, uh, we risk to lose money in the very end. I think that will not happen to Croatia but we have to all work to make sure that that doesn't happen. It is a unique instrument. Um, it is not foreseen that it is prolonged. It is not foreseen that it continues forever. It is not foreseen that it is repeated immediately because next generation EU in total is about 700 billion euros. The European Commission has to borrow lots of money on the markets to make these money available. And the loans component, the governments will pay back to the Commission, but the grants component is not paid back. So we will have to find also ways for this to be paid back after 2028. In the European Parliament, the position of the Parliament is to work through own resources. 
to, uh, to make sure that this is being paid back. Uh, what I want to say is the instrument is here, it is here for now, it will end in 2026, so let's make um, best use of it, focus on implementation and also, as we discussed before, repower EU. It is a new opportunity, uh, almost 200 million euros in grants for Croatia for investments in energy. We just gave the green light, we just voted it in the European Parliament two weeks ago. Mm, so if you have any projects in the area of energy which were not covered by, uh, by the recovery and resilience facility, Repower EU will be the place to, uh, to uh, present them, to discuss them with the government and to uh, to include them. We're leaving Zagreb today as EPP group very confident. I would like to congratulate you on everything that you have done so far and assure you that the EPP will be with you to support you also for the next uh, stages. And in order for all of us to be strong for the next stages, a lunch is waiting for all of us in the restaurant. Once again, thank you very much for your hospitality. Carlo, Croatian colleagues, thank you very much. Thank you.